to my author's chat of the week. And I always like to start by saying or asking, uh, what are you reading right now? I'm waiting currently for my co-host to log on and see if we can do this shindig. But how is everybody else's week going? It is... What day is today? Thursday. <laughs> Thursday here. And, uh... The weekend is right around the corner, which I am very excited about because tomorrow is a book release. So for me, that's always exciting. But yes, I am waiting in for my current co-host. Let's see if she logs on. Hello, hello. So yeah, so just uh, to fill you in while we're waiting, um, yeah, so I have a book release tomorrow. It's actually an omnibus book release, which if you were like me and didn't really know that term until recently, that is when you fit a collection of several books in one print version. So my Guardian Speaker series, which is my Viking fantasy seen behind me, that will be bundled in the first four books will be available together and one e-version, one print version in both, well the print versions plural in both hardcover and the paperback, so that is exciting. There she is. I'm about to go live with my co-host. Hello. Hi. How are you today? Pretty good, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. I see we have like a similar memo on colored t-shirts. <laughs> Planned. No. Planned. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you for coming out and joining me today. I'm actually going to drop this a little bit. There we go. Um, but yeah, I'm so excited to actually get to talk to you. And uh, how I usually do these things is um, just because we have different viewers who will come in through each of our different platforms. Uh, you do a little spiel about who you are, what you write. I'll do a little pitch on my end. And then we just talk about books and fantasy writing and everything. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds good. So you want like, me to do my little spiel then? Yes, do your spiel. And if you have visuals, I love visuals too. Oh gosh, I should have prepared <laughs> that. They're <laughs> okay. like all. I'm, it's okay. I I'm will, in the middle of moving, so. Oh, that's that's a lot. I get it. I get it. I definitely get it. I'll be putting um, links below when I reshare this onto YouTube, so you'll have your all your information below anyway, so people can find your books. But yes, tell me your spiel. Go to your pitch. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm Emily Fluke. I also have another pen name that I'm starting called Scarlet Graves. That's just for uh, horrors and thrillers because I don't want to get my mystery and romance people mixed in with the horror thriller people. Um, yeah, so Emily Fluke, I write all fairy tale retellings. So everything in any of my universes, whether it's horror, romance, whatever it is, it will have some sort of classic story that's twisted. Uh, usually I write mostly for moms, like really realistic mom, funny, sarcastic characters. But uh, obviously with the horror thrillers, that will be a little bit different. So if we're just going under Emily Fluke, it is usually lighthearted, happy mysteries and fantasies that are uh, funny and always a fairy tale. I love that. I absolutely love that. We'll, we'll be going into uh, all that in a moment. But uh, for people who don't know me, I am Catherine E.Y. Bell. I am an author of various epic fantasy series. They range from young adult, new adult, to adult literature. And depending on the series, depends on how dark it gets. My young adult series, The Jet Chronicles, it's like, kind of like what you were saying, was a little lighthearted. It's adventure portal fantasy. It's a lot of fun. It's pretty much a free-for-all because it deals with a multiverse full of pretty much any kind of mythological entity or being from all over the world just kind of thrown in there. I've been having a lot of fun creating that series so far. And it starts off with the 12 tasks. There are two out right now and the third will hopefully be squeezed in this year before the end, but we will see. Um, so, and in my other two series, my, I have a four book uh, new adult shifter war fantasy. The series itself is called the Incarn Saga. It's like I said, four books in length and it's about a kingdom on the verge of war where both the native shifter race, so the shapeshifters, and the humans have to kind of push aside their differences to try to hopefully unite and defend an evil. So that's that one. And my final series is The Guardian Speaker. 
and that is my dark Viking fantasy. So that one I am having a lot of fun putting out. It's six in length right now. They're all ebooks, but tomorrow, which is so exciting, and today, for those who watch this after the fact, July 14th. So tomorrow, July 15th, I will be releasing the first four in an omnibus version, which means the first four are going to be printed out in one book that you can get in hardcover, paperback, and ebook as well. So yay, two new books. <laughs> Congrats. That sounds awesome. So when you say dark, Dark in what way? Are they violent? I mean, I'm assuming Vikings. They're going to be violent. What yes. else? Yes. Okay. So for my dark uh, fantasy, which is my new adult, my adult. Yeah, they're more dark in the sense of violence. In the, uh, one is truly a war bit, you know, circled around a war. And the other one, because it's immersive in uh, Viking mythology, Viking mythology, well, Nordic mythology is very dark and among itself. And it's a retelling. <laughs> I just, I have really thought about it and I was trying to figure this out. I was like, does it qualify as a retelling? And it does in a weird way. So I've been doing a lot of research and investing in that one. And essentially I took a couple characters that were pulled in like a pair of lines in one saga and a pair of lines in another saga and decided to just write their story. So I'm turning their two to four lines into a 16 novella series. But it technically is a retelling, so <laughs> I'm just fleshing it out a lot. <laughs> I like yeah. it. Okay, that's yeah. awesome. So, yes, they are dark. They are in the Viking series. will kind of morph into more of a grimdark level towards the end, but again, Norse mythology. So if you want the lighter stuff, that's why I have my young adult. If you like the really darker stuff, that's why I have my Viking one and everything in between. <laughs> I like it. Nice I have finally sort of figured out my Vanna Whiting right now, so I kind of really like this thing. So it was far easier than always just having a stack of books that I'm shuffling through. So I always advise that reverse poster so you don't have to inverse. It's beautiful. Anywho. So, okay, let's go and talk. You were saying about your series. You do the retellings, and I know that's super popular right now. So can we know what a little bit about your, like, what retellings are you doing? Are you doing like the Robin? I've talked to some people who are doing Robin Hood retellings, so others are doing Snow White. Now, what are your retellings? Can I mean now? So I've done a little bit of everything. My first book in my Mari Fable mystery series, which is, um, I call it mysteries, but it's more urban fantasy. Um, actually, it was funny. I designed the cover to sit on a mystery shelf, and then Barnes and Noble was like, "No, this is fantasy. We're putting it on our fantasy shelves." <laughs> so now it, it's actually that's helped me a lot. I'm like, okay, I need to call this a fantasy now. But anyways, um, that one starts with Little Red Riding Hood, but mm -hmm. that whole series, every single book is kind of a mashup of a bunch of different ones because the premise of that is that uh, fairy tales come alive in our world. So I have an uh, an investigator who. She's a brand new mom, so it's got all the mom things. Every book kind of is about a different phase of motherhood. And uh, she becomes, well, that's actually too much of a spoiler. So basically fairy tales come alive in our world. There's a little, a very thin veil between fictional and reality. And the first book deals with anything from Hunchback of Notre Dame to Red Riding Hood to uh, The Ugly Duckling. Let's see what else. Oh, there, that, there's that a bunch. That is a wide-ranging retelling. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, and then book two, we've got The Swan Maiden, Frankenstein. Book three is Pinocchio and Alice in Wonderland. And they're all just kind of mixed together in really weird ways, but it's so much fun. And then my Folklore Falls romance series, uh, I stick with just one retelling for each. So the first book in that series, those technically aren't don't need to be read in order either. Those can be standalones. Uh, the first book is uh, Robin Hood, so but it's gender bent. So the female is Robin Hood and the male like is... Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the book I'm working on right now, my work in progress is fake dating's a beast, which is obviously a beauty and the beast retelling contemporary. So that one's pretty straightforward. Um, and then my horror thrillers I'm doing, I'm releasing the first episode on Kindle Bella of my young adult horror, uh, Hansel and Gretel. So it's called escaping Hansel and it's a modern day escape room aesthetic of Hansel and Gretel. Ooh, that's cool. I kind of want to now know how an escape room aesthetic goes into a piece of literature, but that's neat. That is exciting. Oh, it was fun. I, I created all the puzzles myself. 
so that readers can solve them along the way with the character. Um, and since I'm doing this episodically through Kindle Vela, it's going to be really fun to see people try to solve the puzzle before the next episode comes out. That's really neat. That is cool. Hi, I have, a, I have a cu couple comments. One, one was laughing about four book series saying that, uh, that, uh, it's small. And then the other one says, I used to believe in fairy tales. So there you go. Hey, I still believe in fairy tales. I dare you. <laughs> They're just, they're just maybe not as uh, obvious as you think, but there you go. Or, or as Disney as you think. Oh, that is true. I mean, the original fairy tales, if you think about the Grimm's and all that kind of stuff, they were pretty dark and twisty. Oh yeah, very dark. They lend really well to horrors and thrillers. So actually V-Myth made a comment. She said, I'm going to add it to my Kindle Vela list. So just real quick, V-Myth, um, that is under a pen name, Scarlet Graves. So you won't find it under Emily Flute, just to let you know. Good, good, good. Um, so I've never, I haven't really looked into Kindle Vela, but so explain that for people like me who don't know much about it, since it's still relatively new. Yeah, so it's really new to me too. Um, the only thing that really helps me understand it more is my husband actually reads episodic comics. Mm -hmm. So he, I watch him, he'll read, you know, an episode, and then he'll get really excited for the next episode. The first few are usually free to get you hooked, right? And then um, you you pay, like, I don't know how exactly the coins work as a reader, but basically you pay, like, a certain amount, like you would a game on your phone, kind of, and then you'll get so many more episodes that you can read, and I think those can be anything. They don't have to be just, like, my story. It can just be whatever stories you want to read. Um, yeah, and then you just kind of follow. And the fun thing is that readers can comment along the way, and the author can leave questions. So my first episode for Escaping Hansel comes out in September uh, to get ready for Halloween. And I left a question on there, like, what do you think should happen next? Um, when we get more into the puzzle part of it, I'm going to say things like, how do you solve this? What do you think the answer to this is? How is my main character is called Gemini? How do you think Gemini is going to get out of this, this room alive? Because there's lots of different rooms. So, um, yeah, I think the fun part of it is really the interactive part. Mm -hmm. That is going to be fun to play with. Again, I'm new. This will be my first episode coming out with it. But yeah, so as a reader, you just kind of start and play around with all the free stories on all the different authors on there and see what you like. And then if you're involved and in, invested in any of them, then that's when you kind of pay like, you know, a two ninety nine, and you get a set of coins and you can spend it on whatever stories you want. So how big are the stories? And then I'm going to go through because I have a lot of comments starting to pop up. But so how big are your episodes, as you call them? Like, how, are they? So the word count, page count? They I don't know can how range. Oh. Okay. Yeah, they can range a lot. So what I'm doing for my episodes is I'm doing about a thousand words. Okay. Because that I'm, I'm keeping kind of chapter based. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's actually a little short for a chapter. Usually I go around 2,500 words for a chapter. Yeah, 2,000, 2,500 well. words. Yeah. Um, but I'm probably going to keep them pretty short just because it's YA. Um, it's really fast paced because it's thriller horror based. Uh, and then also I want to give people a chance to kind of solve the puzzles before the character does. Ah, that's so cool. Okay. So I have some comments that saying, okay, one says an escape room is where you get stuck in a room with puzzles. Okay. Yes. If you don't know what an actual, well, escape room is that uh, there is like a trend that's been going on for a number of years of those of like uh, places where you and a group of people could be friends it could be randos thrown together go into a room they shut the door you have an hour and it's some kind of theme and you have to solve certain puzzles to free yourself so a theme um when i was living in new orleans a theme was escape marie laveau before she comes after you you have one hour to go through her house and try to get in and get out and try to acquire whatever they say you need to acquire to find the key and get out. So those are actual things you can do, but I've never actually seen an escape room put into the literature. So this is kind of really cool to me. I like this. Well, yeah, I was like really a day. I'm sorry, we're getting off topic. So we're really no, 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 that, like that's the one thing room. is once we talk about our books, we can go anywhere and it'll loop back. Don't worry. It always does. <laughs> Good. Uh, hey, Amanda. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so escape rooms, I started doing them and I got really obsessed. I've done like 30 at this point. I built a couple of them. I've worked at an escape room place to kind of help people build them. 
Um, and then I was like, why are these not in stories? Because I, as a writer and a reader, I, was, I started looking for those. I have found a couple of books with them. Um, the first one I read was hashtag no escape. It's part of the hashtag murder trending YA horror novels. Uh, if you've heard of those, um, she does have the side uh, book called hashtag no escape. Uh, it's a good book. It's really fun. It's a great horror for young adult, but I was a little disappointed that there were no puzzles that the reader could solve. So that's when I was like, all right, I need to write one of these with puzzles the readers can solve. I like that. And then some comments saying, oh, they always thought escape room was a secure room in the house in case of home invasion. I think that's a panic room, but a safe room. Yeah, a, a little different. Um, Villa is geared more towards serialized stories, as I understand it. And then one other question was, um, so the escape rooms are like the Saw movies. I guess you could say that, but that's a little dark. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that, that's a twisted version. There are some movies, there is actually a movie, two movies called Escape Room based off the, you know, the physical game. But, um, and I think the first one, which if you've never seen, there was, I don't remember if it came out in the early 90s, but it was called Cube. That was the first oh. Escape Room style movie. And there were three of them that get really weird, but the first one was Cube and it, people wake up in this little cube and each there's a like a door on each side and it's kind of a moving puzzle and you're trying to escape this trap and i it, no one knows how they got there or why and they're all trying to solve it and survive it, one of those survivalist kind of things but that's escape room um okay so going back to your stuff that is so cool i again didn't really understand kindervilla and been so busy writing my normal stuff that i never looked into those emails that amazon sends authors saying hey Check out this new resource. Check out this new. I, I should maybe should have, but I never did. So this is really neat. <laughs> okay, so another pop up. It says in our Star Wars, Star Wars RP, I would put my apprentices in something like that. Sith, we're evil. Eh, well, there you go. But going back to your books and talking about it, another thing that you mentioned when you were doing your pitch was Barnes & Noble. So then you are an author who is wide. I am I'm an author who's currently exclusive through Amazon. So I always like talking to people who are, I'm assuming you're, you're wide, right? No. No, no. Oh, so no, all I, I have- I assume this. I heard Barnes & Noble. I was like, she must be wide, but okay, yes. So you are- Okay, so what I- Yes. So listen. far, what I do is I just have my ebook. So everything I write is available on Kindle Unlimited, except, of course, the Kindle Vela stuff is not going to be. Um, but uh, yeah, so currently I am not wide. I am exclusive to Amazon, but I have paperbacks in Barnes & Noble and Walmart and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so it's the paperbacks that are kind of wherever wherever the bookstores want to pick them up. Um, but yeah, the ebooks you cannot get like on Barnes & Noble Nook or anything like that. Okay, okay. So the paperbacks, is, so then you do Ingram, you're one of the authors who does like in, Ingram Sparks for the, okay, interesting. Again, I only went through Amazon and I've been debating if I should move my print versions or at least have print version versions in Ingram Spark. So that is interesting. Oh. Do, you, do you like it? I mean, how, was it you that I saw that did a book signing in... Barnes and Noble, or was that a different author? Uh, may, have been, may have been a different author, but I have done a book signing in Barnes and Noble. I do have an author panel coming up at Barnes and Noble as well. Um, so I'd like to have that opportunity because I do like to do in-person things. I really love reading out loud in front of people and stuff. So that's just like a fun opportunity for me. Um, so because of that, like I have been really grateful for Ingram Spark getting my books out there and distributing them. And of course, I had to reach out and do a lot of you know marketing myself, but they made it possible for Barnes and Noble to pick it up. So now like my local ones and cause there's about five Barnes and Nobles in my area. So they're going to all carry my books. Um, and then every time I get a new one out, I basically just email them and I say, Hey, I got another one out and they pick it up. They were actually really excited to stock my romance because they said romance is trending right now. So I was like, Oh, sweet. <laughs> it's funny because I wrote, I wrote my Mari Fable mystery series, the, the first one, Death of a Fairy Tale, just for Kindle Unlimited. And then it got kind of big on Book Talk. So I was like, all right, I'll make paperbacks. And then Barnes & Noble ended up really liking it. And then I went and wrote my romance. And I was like, this one will just be for Kindle Unlimited. And now Barnes & Noble is saying, no, we really want the paperback of that one. So it's been so funny because 
even though I am exclusive to Kindle Unlimited, I don't really do much on there. I don't really get a lot of income from there. It's mostly from my paperbacks. And it's so funny because I intended every time setting out just to write for KU. Yeah, right now, KU is still my my bread and butter. <laughs> Though I have heard, depending on, you know, the trends and your, especially like how popular on TikTok and who you can reach, you know, that does help and lend to people who like the print versions. I prefer print versions. I can't get myself behind a, you know, a iPad or any of these, or a, any of these e-readers. I just cannot make myself read that way. I'm just that old school. I need to feel the pages. <laughs> I do too. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I don't even have Kindle Unlimited myself because I don't really read ebooks at all. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the same way when it came to audio because I just never made an effort to convert my books to audiobooks because I don't listen to audiobooks. I didn't really think about it. And then people, kind of like what you were talking about, I had a lot of questions about that from Book Talk and they're like, hey, we are only people who listen to audiobook and are, you know, can you do this? And I'm like, okay, challenge accepted. So that's my, my next hurrah is trying to get some audiobooks out there before the end of the year, crossing fingers. <laughs> oh, that'll be awesome. I love listening to audiobooks. It's such a great way for me personally to like get cleaning done, not be bored while I'm driving, like audiobooks, love them. So that's actually a project I want to start doing as well. Let me know how yours goes because I'm excited to kind of dive into that eventually. Yeah, it's fun, but the thing, like, I probably should have asked a lot of people, or more people on, you know, just a voice, and I did ask uh, preliminary ways, like, do you prefer a male voice or a female voice? Is there any kind of accents you do or do not like? Because everybody has a preference, and I'm still trying to figure out if there is a trend. I'm kind of all over the board with my three series. I have different groupings of people doing them, so... We'll see if any of them hits. I mean, I like all the people who I've contracted with. I think I'm really very excited about some of these projects. And uh, hope hope it's worth it. Because <laughs> for an indie author, everything is expensive. <laughs> Cries. Very true. <laughs> so what got you into fairy tales? Like, what pulled you into these retellings of some kind of lore and fairy tales? I think my first thing was I was really obsessed. I know this sounds funny because this isn't really retelling, but when Disney put out the Maleficent movie, I was like obsessed with it. I actually watched it while I was in labor with my daughter. And <laughs> um, I was, yeah, no, I don't know. And then that just kind of got me really involved in the I don't know, fairy tales in general, thinking like this is kind of a twist on Sleeping Beauty, right? Because we're getting to learn more about Maleficent. And I saw that kind of as a twist and I started reading more of those. I started reading Holly Black and she, you know, she does a lot of fairy tale type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think I just started reading more and more of it. I really loved Cinder in that series. Um, yeah, I don't, I just, I was taking a writing class a while back online and I wrote a uh, dystopian version of Rapunzel where Mother Gothel gets, is a surrogate, um, mother for like a politically powerful couple and then she takes you know steals Rapunzel, Rapunzel to save her life from this dystopian world and uh the teacher really just was like you have a knack for doing retellings like taking something familiar and messing around with it and twisting it so I was like maybe I do so I started doing it and then I just was like now I can't go back I love this this is so much fun I love just reading stories and looking up online like how the originals are different and trying to pull out all the old stuff that people have forgotten because Disney yeah. kind of like erased it. Right. So it's been fun. Like it's, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's how I got into it, I guess. I have a comment here saying, I love Holly Black. They, yeah. I was going to say, I've only read one of her books. And I think it was an early on book though. I do have a couple of hers on my uh, wish list to my, which I'm using right now. Now that I discovered that's a thing as my TBR so I can remember things. <laughs> but yeah, so I have to read a few more of her stuff because I know she is very popular as well for the retelling kind of things. Tith, yeah, another comment said, um, Tith was the first book I ever read. Yes, that's the one I have on my bookshelf. Tith Modern Fairy Tale. Is that one you've read from Holly Black? See, it was, no, not yet. It's, it, it was kind of a, a nice little twist on 
some of the more darker fey lore in that series so that's what uh that's the only example of her stuff that I have, but then only recently when joining Book Talk, people were like, oh yeah, you should read more of her stuff. She has a whole wide variety in her little niche. And I was just like, oh, that's interesting. Interesting. Yep. <laughs> okay, so as an author, why did you choose, how, how did you go about figuring out your publishing approach? Because... I know some people will kind of join in and watch and like to learn, you know, the whole background of publishing. So what got you choose, I don't know if I'm wording this right, um, Kindle Limited versus any other platform? Was it because you, you know, talked to a lot of people? Did you just go up by gut? Did you do your research? Or how did you make your decisions? I'm going to go Ingram with your print and Kindle Unlimited for your eBooks, if that makes sense. Well, so originally I just wanted to do traditional publishing and I was planning to query and everything. So I had actually started a writer's group. There's uh, seven of us now. And it turned out kind of just that I was half and half. Half the group was trying to go traditional. Half the group was trying to go indie. And I had really never considered indie before. It was just not something I was like, I don't know how to market. I'm not even going to try. So (laughs) I avoided it until this group was like, no, you should just try it. So for NaNoWriMo last year, I wrote Death of a Fairy Tale in a month and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to throw this up on Kindle Unlimited because it sounds kind of simple and I'll market it when I can, but I'm not going to worry about it. It was supposed to just be this really like simple thing to just say, hey, if somebody reads it, they read it. If they don't, I'll be fine with that. And I'll just go back to querying my other stuff. Um, And then it ended up being so much fun and I had so much support from Book Talk because my writers group convinced me to join TikTok uh, at the time too. And from my group, and I just learned from the 20 books to 50K group. And I don't know, I just, I picked Kindle Unlimited over wide for now because of how simple it is. Again, because I thought going into this, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, (laughs) I'll I'll eventually go back to traditional is what I was planning. Um, So I was just like, I'll just have a few in Kindle Unlimited. And if people read them, fine, I probably won't make any money off of it. And then my whole, like, everything just changed my perspective on it. I was like, oh my gosh. I can make money doing this. I can actually have fans, readers, without depending on an agent and a publisher and waiting years and years and years and years to do this. And that was where, you know, my last thing was kind of like, well, my dream was to see it on a shelf at a bookstore. And I just made that happen myself. And it's been such a wild ride. But I'm still in Kindle Unlimited just because of the simplicity of it. I think eventually I might go wide. We'll see. But my favorite part about indie publishing is being experimental and just being like, okay, here's this new thing, Kindle Vela. Let's try it. Here's, you know, asking a bookstore to carry my book. Let's try it. Let's try to do an author panel. Let's try to do a book signing and see what they say. The worst they can say is no. Right. Uh And I've hardly gotten any no's. It's been amazing because my perspective before was like, you have to have a traditional public. You have to go through one of the big four to do anything is what I believed and really thought for years and years. And yeah, so yeah, my perspective has just totally changed. But again, I still, I'm pretty technologically challenged. So with stuff like (laughs) uh, going wide, I'm a little, still a little nervous about all that. So we'll see. Yeah, no, I I definitely understand. I'm kind of with you in the sense that I was, when I was kind of working my way through writing my first book, I had joined a writing group as well. And I had people there who, had worked in the publishing industry who were published, but they were more like the poet side of things. So that was a little different. And I had a couple people who were indie and I never heard about, you know, what indie was until kind of talking with them and figuring that out. And so I did query originally, but um, learned, I write very big books and trying to market them for the, you know, certain genres. You try to keep certain links in like the publishing industry, as well as you have to keep on trend and there's a lot of things to it. So mine weren't necessarily hitting the mark because they were very, very big, <laughs> nor did I want to cut that much of the story out. And so I just went with uh, indie initially and kind of, I, I would say I fell on my face a little bit more early on because I just didn't understand or know what to do marketing wise, but uh, slowly getting better at that. Still not, I feel like quite there, but I love learning. And that's why I kind of like doing these things and just learning from other authors and finding out what you've done differently and what you like and vice versa. (laughs) 
Yeah. So a little bit off topic, but, you, but what we were talking about earlier, audiobooks. I think if you have big books too, you're going to lend, personally, your books are going to lend really well to audio because people I've heard, like listening to podcasts and stuff, people tend to spend like their audible coins and stuff on the big books just because it's more hours of re- listening time. Mm-hmm. They don't want the short books because it's going to be over like that, you know? So they've got a big trip coming up. They're going to buy your series and audio and just listen to the whole thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that we'll see. It is because I'm, I am curious about this because, like, my full lengths, uh, the ones pop, those series are, you know, pretty hefty books in respect to what most people write right now. I think, like, a lot of people aim between what is it, 80 to 120 or something thousand hours <laughs> somewhere in that range. Mine are definitely bigger. But then I have my short ones, which was challenging myself to try to see, can I go the opposite way and write novellas, which are really fun because I can produce a couple of them a year versus I'm not a fast person to turn around books. I can, there are people I believe and they've put another book out. I wish I was that fast. I don't know how people do that. I respect that. I am not one of them, (laughs) but you know, it's been fun doing the little novellas, and I think my, well, it should be, should be, my first audiobook will be of My Guardian Speaker, which is a novella, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how people take it on audio, because it is going to be on the shorter side of the thing, but it'll be released in a couple weeks, so I'm kind of like, oh, <laughs> my first, <laughs> and now the question is how to market that, because again, that is my weak spot, is how do you market, <laughs> how do you market audio? <laughs> I think the same way you just offer, you know, and then people get to go, you know, you just talk about them and then people go to your page and they go, Oh, it's available on audio too. Sweet. I may not have bought it. You know, if it wasn't is how some readers see things, I think, depending on what their preference of medium is for reading. Mm-hmm. So you were saying that probably as an experience of your own, that a lot of your characters are the mother type. Um, what, how would you describe well, which of your favorite character? Oh my god, I can't word this. Which book character is your favorite from your theories? Uh, let's see. If we're going from the Mar- Mari Fable mystery series, actually, Kai is probably my favorite. That's my main character's husband. He's really oh. funny, um, but he's also really supportive, and they have a happy marriage, which you don't get to really see a lot of yeah. in, especially mysteries and suspense. It's usually always like one of the spouses is cheating or something horrible. So Mm -hmm. I really wanted to subvert that and make it different. Um, So I think writing like this happy marriage and having this really supportive husband, who's also, he's also has his own goals. He's a history professor. So he lends really well to her being an investigator and all these fairy tales because he looks at the history behind the stories. So it's just been really fun to write him. Oh, I love that. (laughs) So, Okay, are you a person who writes with one a singular perspective? So you have like a main character and you follow him, her, them, you know, the whole route, or do you kind of flip perspectives chapter by chapter, you know, between characters? You know, there are different ways authors approach. I write one main character perspective and a, a large cast of others, but I just follow that one character. I've never tried that multiple perspective approach. So just curious, which way do you do? Do you love both? Yeah, so I usually only do the one perspective just like you. Um, especially like my Mari Fable mystery series, it's one perspective. It is Mari Fable's perspective in everything. But I started my uh, romance and I did a couple of chapters in my Robin Hood from the guy's perspective just to kind of bring him in a little bit. And I did have readers say, you know, they like it when there's more of that. They want it to switch back and forth. So I think in my Beauty and the Beast, I'm going to have it switch back and forth every chapter between the Beast and Beauty. Um, so that'll be a little bit new for me. Uh, yeah, a little bit because everything else I've written is pretty much one perspective. Mm-hmm. I do have a series that I want to get to next year. I want to start next year. It's going to be kind of like a reverse of my Mari Fable mystery. So instead of um, hunting supernatural creatures, it'll be supernatural creatures that are hunted, but it's a mom group who of, of supernatural creatures who have these children, their play date group. And the whole series is going to be about basically these supernatural moms protecting their supernatural children from hunters like Sam and Dean Winchester. So that'll be really fun to write. But I think for that one, I'm going to actually skip around between all the mom 
perspectives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's that's fantastic. Okay. Do you write then until you hit your Beauty and Beast book, have you written only female leads then? Or have you done a book with male? Yeah, okay, that's me. But it's because it's one of those write what you know. So starting off, this is what I know. Will I change as my, I have different book series? Yes, I think I will. But right now it was just a comfort level of starting with my earlier works with a female perspective since that's how I identify. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I, was, I wasn't quite ready to, to branch out and be like, let's make sure I get this voice right on any other kind of identity. So I was like, let's go with something that I'm familiar with. Uh, but now I'm branching out and it's been it's been fun. And I do think, you know, you said you write YA, right? So I do think even though at one point, obviously, we were younger, I think that's still writing in a perspective that you're not technically in at this time, you know, so that that's a little branching out, I think. <laughs> a little bit. It is kind of funny because thinking about it, my debut series character, her name is Yueva Cargan. She is a, it's perspective of a shifter. So versus a human, I wanted my main character to be a shapeshifter. And that was a lot of fun kind of getting a character that is, has a lot of instinctual aspects that kind of tie in with her animal form. Um, but her age range was around the age range where I came up with that idea. So that was my late teens, early 20s. So that was that cast. Uh, writing the Viking series, they're more like the 20s and 30s, which, you know, that was kind of what I was working on when I was that age. But yeah, going back, kind of, re not regressing, but like <laughs> trying to channel my younger self. And I will say my younger self because my young adult series um, is based on a character that was developed in my childhood. She was my alter ego that I played with along with my sister during our imaginary play. So a lot of those characters pulled from our childhood um, multiverse that we developed are now being thrown into those books. But the main character is my alter ego. So it's been a lot of fun to kind of channel what did I think when I was this age? How did I act when I was that age? I wonder, and I'll like put her in like an outfit that I actually had at that age and stage. So at one point when I was going into like my punk rock, I have her in like some faded drummer girl <laughs> t-shirt because I, that's what I ran around in for a while. But like, that's been a lot of fun trying to channel a younger state of mind and make sure that readers, you know, if they're like, well, she's immature, I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> she is on the younger side, but I, you, I am following her through a number of years, so she will age up as the series goes, but it is kind of fun trying to be like, how would a character at this age act in this scenario? If that scenario was possible in a multiverse full of dragons and fey and elves etc and so on <laughs> that's really cool yeah and it's not i mean it's not only fun i feel like for you to be kind of nostalgic in that way but you're getting it more accurate too for sure there a character for you that you're like that's that's a version of myself in one of your books or have you kind of just totally created novel characters and just put maybe relatable traits in them if that's distinguishable enough <laughs> Yeah, Mar Mari Fable, probably from my main series. Sorry, my computer keeps going off to save and it's making me dark, um, but, or shadowy. Um, yeah, Mari Fable, I would say, is similar to me that she, I mean, she's a mom. She's paranoid half the time over her child, you know, overprotective in some ways. She is also, like, hyper high strung, probably more stressed out than she needs to be over silly things. She is really motivated. Um, she wants to get a Pulitzer Prize in her journalism. because She's an investigative journalist. And, you know, that kind of is pulling from myself or like, I want to write a bestseller, of course, you know, so yeah. it's, it's similar but different. Um, and yeah, so and she's sarcastic, but she's definitely like a lot funnier and wittier than I am. I'm not like that, you know, like I have time to think about it when I'm writing her, but I'm not like that in real life. So, but yeah, there's aspects for sure. I'd say she's the closest because the rest of my characters are, um, yeah, pretty different <laughs> from me. Hey, that, hey, that's fine. And that's, I guess, the a great way to approach writing is, you know, to challenge yourself because you don't want your characters to be 
a thousand versions of you you want them to be real individual unique people so yes you can have a version of you you might even have three throughout your series but you don't want every character to be an almost imprint of the one prior <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so what for you is the hardest thing to do as a writer like is it the writing process is it marketing is it finding time for sanity you know <laughs> that's it those are all good ones um gosh probably just getting an, a, a good schedule an organized schedule mm -hmm. i've been really like following an unhealthy schedule I would not recommend this. I don't know. My brain seems to work in binges. So I will sit down and write and do nothing else for several weeks. And then I will do the whole book, um, which for me has worked really well because then I remember like every single detail. Whereas if I write like 500 words a day or a thousand words a day, then it was, you know, like a month ago that I wrote this first chapter. Mm. And I feel like those, it's just not, even though, even if I go back and reread it, it's not quite the same headspace that I was in when I wrote it. So I had like a specific plan and where I was going because I do outline, but I tend to go off the outlines quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and I think that I want to stay in that headspace. So while I say it's unhealthy because I'm literally sitting in my chair for like three weeks straight doing nothing else. Um, it's also been really good for my writing process. So I haven't really decided what works. I wish I could kind of, just figure out an organization schedule. That's good. I think that's been the hardest thing because now I, I'm off my writing schedule at this point in time. Um, I should be binging my beauty and the beast story, but since I just finished the Pinocchio project, the book three of my Mario Fable mysteries, I really need a break and it's hard for me to get back into that headspace um, mm. right away. Uh, Cause I know I'm like, all right, I just binged. Now I need like three weeks to do zero writing uh, but I know in my head, because of my deadline, I should be starting already. And it'd be smart if I just did yeah. a thousand words a day and it was like more healthy about this. Can't do it. So that's my biggest thing I wish I could fix. I, don't, I mean, I've, I've heard, I'm trying to remember if he's one of the people from 20 books, because you were talking about 20 books, 50K, but I'm trying to remember what author, which author was this was. But anywho, one of them who is an author who kind of sits like you, sits down knocks out a book in like three weeks and the rotation was three weeks of like insane writing one week off to be compressed three weeks of insane writing one week off to be compressed again it's one of those that i blink and there's another book i'm not that person <laughs> i definitely am like i like to write and keep if i can my writing or my new material writing in the morning and then i leave my afternoons open for other author stuff. So, you know, these kind of chats, doing the social media, answering emails, formatting, editing, going, you know, revisions, all that stuff is in the afternoon. It does kind of stall out, you know, makes things longer, even, <laughs> but it kind of helps me. And then for me, I don't have necessarily as big of a burnout after a book, but even still, it's nice to take a few days off <laughs> and pat yourself on the back and be like, I'm done. <laughs> I achieved my goal. I need a break. <laughs> Where's a massage? I don't know. But, you know, just, you know, that that's do something nice to treat yourself. And for me, like, anytime I release something, my, my routine is if it's a, you know, if I'm releasing a book, I'll get a little bottle of champagne. So after the whole day, because I do the book release, it's a whole day of pushing. I'm, like, posting on social media and making sure the all the links are correct everywhere and the website's up and it does take it's almost it surprises me every time i think it's not going to take as long but it takes me all day to do that first overhaul of my book is out books out so and by the end of the day i pop that champagne and i'm like i am done <laughs> oh that feels so good too <laughs> <laughs> Do you have like a little celebratory uh, or a way to celebrate or are you just kind of be like, ah, it's out there on to the next thing? Uh, probably something different every time. I don't know. I just, like I said, I take a break and I probably take too long of a break and then I just like go play video games and that's <laughs> kind of hey. like my celebration. Yes. Hey, that's an, always a great way to just be, you know, 
at, do something for you that you don't get to do a lot. You know, just a way to treat yourself. So that's kind of fun too. And you, um, let me go back. I'm going to kind of rewind for a second. So kind of going back to the concept, and this was just something I wanted to say because I was thinking about it as I was talking to you. I have never tried to write a married or, as of yet, or a mom character because I'm not in that stage yet of my life. And it's something that, you know, when you are trying to challenge yourself as a writer to write from another mindset and you're creating all these novel characters, I'm wondering, should I step into those kind of that mindset of a, another person that, you know, that's different than me? Or should I wait till it's genuine when I get to those stages because I don't want it to sound fake? Does that make sense? Have you ever tried to like, you know, decide if you wanted to write a character that has a very different perspective, maybe, you know, um, a different orientation or a different, you know, just something that's so drastically different than from you, but you don't want to insult people who, for me, would be like, in this scenario, a mom. I wouldn't want to, like, write a mom and you're like, no. <laughs> she is too perky. She needs, <laughs> she needs to be like, <laughs> you know, she's she's not stressed enough. I don't know, you know. I, I, I wouldn't know how to approach some of those scenarios. Have you tried to challenge yourself to come up with a character that is so different that have you ever worried about how like, as a character has been taken? Maybe that's a better way to word it. Um, not with my any of my published stuff yet. In Escaping Hansel, my main character, Gemini, I do a little bit concerned just because she's um, a teenager. Well, she's 18, but she and she's been through like some really horrible, horrible stuff that I've never dealt with. So I do want to make sure I approach that really carefully. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, parental abuse and that sort of thing. So I just, that one is definitely different from the experiences that I've had, uh, thankfully. But um, yeah, so my next series, I think the one next year with my Supernatural Mother playdate thing, uh, I'm definitely going to do some different ones. I, I'm a little nervous. I want to write like single mothers and stuff. And I want to talk to a lot of single mothers because I'm sure it's mm -hmm. very different from somebody who has support from a partner. Um so, I, yeah, that one I think will be different. And, again, Gemini is probably so far the one that I've already written because I have already written that entire book. I'm just going to be changing it as I go for serialization. But she's pretty different. She's very dark and down and depressed. And that's, that's a little different than me. Uh, but, yeah, I think the single mothers so far will be different. And then writing in My Beauty and the Beast, writing the yeah, Beast perspective will be different since he'll be male and um very always, yeah. <laughs> scary and grumpy. Worry. Yeah, sorry. But yeah, I always worry about, you know, I, I have a couple storylines in the back of my head where I either do that split perspective and incorporate a male perspective, or I have some where I may even have a male main character, but then I'm like, will I write him to sound believable? Because I was recently starting to read a very long series, uh, The Wheel of Time, and sometimes <laughs> the way he writes the women characters, I'm just like, I can't, on a, it pulls me out sometimes, I'm just like, that, I don't believe, no. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> Where did you get this idea from? But overall, I like the book, for all the people out there. It's just every so often, you, I'll read something, I'm just like, I don't feel that's a real good representation of female so but are you uh, yeah. how are you tackling that or how do you intend to tackle that with the beast which is so cool to come from that with the beast perspective because i don't know how many times i've heard of stories where it's not just from bell if that makes sense yeah um and again this is a contemporary retelling so it's not going to be like he's actually a beast or anything so that'll be a little bit different than the original story but um, yeah, it, I think I'm just talking to a lot of guys is my plan. It's always my plan just to talk to a bunch of people that are in this situation. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think, again, I'm not really writing it. This is a romance. This is a sweet romance. Yeah. Men aren't really going to read it for me for this one. So I'm not super worried. I definitely want to get them accurate. I want the, the, um, female identifying people to feel that he's accurately portrayed as a man. Right. But, uh, and that his voice sounds real. So I definitely will talk to a lot of guys, but I, 
again, um, I'm not really gearing the book towards men reading it. So I don't think I'm really worried about a guy reading it and going, this doesn't feel believable to me. So um, yeah, again, my plan is just, I think, really talk to a bunch of guys and give them some of the dialogue and say, does this sound real? Is this how you would react? Stuff like that. Well, here, here's something for you to think about, because you were mentioning how you might want to get into audiobooks as well. And again, I am no expert on this, but it's just something for you to ponder or talk to your fans about. Uh, would, Because I don't know. Again, I don't listen to audiobooks, so I don't know. If, would it be better in the genre of a romantic style book to have a female narrator predominantly? because you have, you know, the probably the female lead or a male narrator because for a female, you know, who's maybe, you know, if you're identifying with a, you know, a straight couple or something like that where you're listening to a, a male voice, give the male parts. <laughs> what would be better? And I, I don't know. I, those are the things I started thinking about for my adventure fantasy because I have female leads. I have casts that are predominantly male. Who's going to narrate that? Do you try to do those two narrators going back and forth? But how do you rank that? You know, all those questions. So things for you to think about, I guess, as you go that way is you or how you want to represent your books with a female narrator, male narrator, a mix, a medley in between. <laughs> yeah, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. So from what I've come across, I personally, I'm hard of hearing. So when it's a male narrator, I actually can't hear him very well. So I pretty much will never buy a book that's a male narrator because the lower pitch is just really hard to understand. Huh. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't know why it's that way, but um, yeah. So I prefer, obviously, if it's a female narrator, making a slightly lower voice for yes. the male characters all the way through but I also have listened to some where they switch back and forth but those are typically just the chapters it's not like you're going to get the guy's dialogue in the female's oh, chapter okay, with okay. a male's voice yeah but then if it switches to the male's perspective then they'll switch to a male narrator mm -hmm. sometimes it just depends so and I've liked both I just usually can't understand the male narrators very well hey and that's the thing is you know as an author yes to some extent you should cater to what your readers once on the other hand you have to like your own product so if you don't like the voice or you can't hear your own you know especially when you're trying to produce it like i going through audible um i have to listen to it and make sure i can hear all the words fluidly and if you have issues hearing a certain kind of pitched voice then that may not be the way you want it to go because you want to be able to enjoy your own work in whatever format it is <laughs> yep very true so, um, so I guess I, we're actually towards the end of the hour. Which, <laughs> see, I think these hours, it's like every time I tell someone this is an hour thing, you know, especially people who haven't done a lot of lives are like, that's a long time. I don't necessarily think they're a long time because once you start talking and again, you can ramble off topic and eventually get back on. But, uh, as we move towards the end of the hour, I guess I want to see, is there anything you would like to, cause again, I'm going to share this on YouTube later. Um, anything you want to tell people, anything you would want to ask, anything you want to talk about before the end of the hour? Um, I know that's not one of those like great questions. That's like, whoa, there's too many possibilities. I can't pick one. <laughs> I know it's not specific enough. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about that. I guess one of my big things and here I'll ask you too, cause I was thinking this earlier cause I see, you know, you have so many books. But you said they're four book series, right? So my thing is, I originally set out to wrote, write, wrote, uh, write the Mari Fable Mysteries. And I plotted it as an 11 book series because I wanted it to be very long because it's heavily inspired by the Dresden Files, which is a very long series um, by Jim Butcher. Um, and I wanted it to be very similar to that. It is, again, heavily inspired by that, but with a female mom main character instead mm -hmm. and with fairy tales. Uh, but it's the exact same vibe. Um, so I, I've just been curious because I've been seeing a lot of other indie authors do trilogies or something shorter, like three, four to five books type thing and stopping there because a lot of readers won't buy the, any books unless the series is done, series is done, oh, yeah. right? Because they don't want to wait or they don't want to lose so trust in the writer, please right? Like, while we're producing this. <laughs> oh, yes. That's hard. So I'm like, 
I'm curious to hear from readers and other authors, like what do you do in terms of the length of your series and why do you choose that length? <laughs> well, for me, <laughs> so funny story, little side tangent, the four book series we're talking about is again, the Incarn Saga. And originally I was, I wrote, I was writing the first book to be like a tester to see if I could complete a book, to see how I could figure out how to publish, to see just to learn from. And I meant to, it to be almost a standalone at that moment. But then when I was kind of almost done with the first book, I was at a writing conference doing some different um, exercises and essentially came in one, one book, came out with a four book series. So uh, I, I just, I kind of realized that was gonna be four books and um, was my debut and practice series. I didn't really, choose it because again i was i'm always like the last one to know things so i didn't even think about the whole fact at that point that some readers won't even buy things until it's complete and for right now it is this one series that um makes the most sales because it's complete the other two i'm still working through and they're going to be longer series but i why i chose them that way that they were just for me i kind of know I'm, I'm, maybe it's just me, but like it's weird because as soon as I come up with a concept of a storyline, I kind of more or less know how long it's going to be, and I already knew these guys were going to be a long series. This will be probably eight to nine books, and this will be five, uh, 15 to 16, so long series, and so it's going to take me a little while to produce all of them, and I just feel like that does those stories justice, so... Yes, I know I will probably have to be waiting a few more years before I get those um, particular readers who wait for a series to com be complete, even though, please don't. <laughs> Authors need to have some monetary compensation in the meantime. But, um, but yeah, I'm not hindering the, any series by, you know, trying to enforce it to be short if I don't feel that does it justice, if that makes sense. But if you like yeah, a no, that... series, I have four books there. If you want a longer series, I got you. You just got to give me a few more years. <laughs> They're coming as fast as I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and that's funny too. I as even as I'm thinking about it, I'm like, actually, you're right. Like now that I look back at my sales of my first two books, they're selling a lot better now that I have the third book out. I feel mm -hmm. like. I guess I'm just gaining readers trust that I will continue the series and I'm not just going to fall off the face of the earth, like yeah. some famous fantasy author that we all know and love. Uh, <laughs> but you know, will he ever finish it? I don't know. But, um, <sighs> so, so yeah, you're right. But I have been like slightly jealous of my writers group friends who have been doing these trilogies and they're like, yeah, I'm done with that series now. And then they just move on. And I'm like, Oh crap. I've got so many books to go and I, I don't have a problem with it. I love my main character. I'm excited mm -hmm. to write all of those books, you know, but I, now I'm thinking it'd be kind of nice to tell readers that the series is done. I mean, it could, it will come in time and it also comes hand in hand with the whole, you have to say goodbye to those characters. And that's, you know, as an author, those are your babies. <laughs> that's hard to do to let them grow up and just be done. But I don't know. I feel like every author has to choose what's right for them. And if you're a person who can turn around a trilogy or a four book series and you're totally happy with it, great. If you're a person who's like very long winded like myself, <laughs> just understand it does take some time. I can't just drop 16 all at once. I mean, that would be a lot of gap years between publishing if I was waiting just to hold them to release them all at once. But. Um, I, and I also think as an author, as like you said, you gain readers as you move along and you also get better at your craft. So for me, having a book that took shy of 10 years to figure out how the heck I was supposed to do this to now being able to have, I wrote a nice, for me, it's a rotation of this is this stage is at one editor. This is stage is at my betas. This stage is getting formatted. This is just published that I'm actually being able to put out multiple works in a year, which for me early on, that was not possible. So I am able to, you know, hopefully keep readers interested in enough that they can wait through those gaps, but it is hard. It's a hard choice. And yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> 
No, you're, I mean, and again, that's a, a, what I was saying earlier about indie publishing. It's, we're so, I guess, lucky in this industry to be able to experiment. And that's kind of why I'm doing my romance series, because I'm like, well, I want to throw out a series where you can pick up any book in the series and you can read it by itself. And it doesn't have to. It's not a series. It's more of like a, a franchise um, yeah, of yeah. this small town, you know? So that'll be fun, too, to see how that works, because each one I'm going to put out and be like, here's a separate one, but you can go back and read the whole series and see all these other characters. Uh, whereas obviously the mystery series, you have to read in order and you have to know what's going on or else you pick up book three and you're like, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's the thing is like, Oh, when you're writing a series that is not kind of like, which I found out talking to a lot of romance writers that yes, they're still qualified as a series though. Most of them are independent because you have different fo focus couples or everything like that. Um, but writing some of these long series, one of the hardest things that at least I've found is trying to understand that even though the majority of people will buy book one and start there, there's going to be someone somewhere that's going to grab either the newest one or fall in the middle of a series and pick one up. And you have to try to, at least in some way, shape, or form, explain everything prior without being so redundant for your reader being like i am five books in can we stop going over this <laughs> we know this already you know so i think that's the trick for me is trying to just give enough explanation slash a reminder if there is a long gap between books for readers and then not sounding like you know it's so repetitive that someone's just going right through they're like again i'm just gonna skip the first chapter <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you That's deal such with, a tricky. Do you deal with that with your continual series with your main with, that follows the same characters? So I've cheated a little bit, and okay. my main character, since she's an investigative journalist, I ended the first book on um, a article that she wrote. It's very short; it's not even a whole page, <laughs> but that kind of like kind of wraps things up in a way, just like a reminder of here's here's how the magic system works and here's what she's going to investigate in the next book. Kind of, I mean, obviously it's uh -huh. from her voice and it's more set in an article. Um, and then I start all the rest of the books and now I'm starting and ending all the rest of the books. with these very short, again, not even usually a whole page, uh, prologues and epilogues that are her writing in her diary. That's and so cool. it's kind of just this really quick, like, this is what I've learned about how like the hood, because my magic system centers around red Riding hoods hood. So she kind of talks about how that works and how, what she's been dealing with the past couple of years. Cause it's, it's supposed to be set two year, about two years, a year and a half between each book, because uh -huh. I'm trying to do the phase, the different phases of motherhood, right? Baby, toddler, Aww. going to preschool. Um, so that's how I've done so far. So I've done that a little bit. Again, I think I'm still learning. I want to make sure I have enough of it. Um, Cause some of the things I'll have like my beta readers go in and they'll be like, you need to remind us what some of these characters look like in between mm -hmm. books and stuff. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I forgot to do that. So yeah, I'm still, still trying to perfect it. <laughs> but again, I cheated a little on the magic system part of it or the world building side of it. I like that, I like that concept because it's always uh, another quick, interesting thing and then we'll we can kind of wrap up but like how there are definitely people who love the concept of a prologue and epilogue and then there are those who are absolutely do not like it i love them so i do utilize them and what i do utilize them not as a reminder which is a very cool way to approach it because then people have that choice of eh, i think i'm good versus you know reading and getting into it but i do utilize that epilogue and prologue and i like taking them because i do write um, from a single perspective. So my prologues and epilogues are from a different character in the series and just a little snippet from a different point of view elsewhere, what's going on that will tie into either that book or the next book, depending on the front end or the back end and just give a different little flavor, hoping that because it is so unique, people will want to read them. <laughs> But if you miss them, it's not necessarily the biggest thing. You're just going to miss some hints, essentially. And you're going to miss, you know, just a little of that extra topping, that sprinkle, that cherry on top, I think. But, yeah, no, that is definitely cool. Do you use a prologue, uh, like you said, the prologues, epilogues in your other series or just that one with the journalist? 
Um, I don't do prologues in the romance, but I do pro epilogues because that's pretty expected in romances. Readers always want to know, okay, did they get married? Did they have a baby? Did they, you know, what happened to them two years, five years down the road? So I do add a short epilogue um, in all the romances just so that people can see what happens after the happily ever after, right? Yes. No, that's cool. I, I, I'm very bad. I have not read a lot of romance. I know that's a horrible thing to admit. It's one of those, like, I really haven't read a lot of, I have read a few, but not a lot. And so definitely missed all the iconic ones and I would not know that was a trend. So that is kind of interesting to me. Well, is there anything else you would like to let anybody know? And if not, I will let you get back to your life. And thank you so much for coming out because I was very excited about talking with you and I'll be able to share this with the world next week too. Um, I guess just let me tell you what books I have coming out soon. Yeah. So this yeah. is currently currently mid-July 2022. I just released The Pinocchio Project, which is book three of the Mari Fable Mysteries. It's like a mashup of Free Guy, um, Ready Player One, including Supernatural and Once Upon a Time. So, But you got to get there. You got to get to book, book one first, Death of a Fairy Tale. Um, and then in October, I have my Beauty and the Beast retelling, Fake Dating's a Beast. So it's the fake dating trope, but it's Contemporary Beauty and the Beast coming out. I'm also releasing in September the first episode of Escaping Hansel, which is a horror thriller for young adults, um, retelling of Hansel and Gretel. And then in December, I have the, A Grim Haunting coming out, which is book four of the Mari Fable Mysteries. It is a retelling of the, oh my gosh, now I'm going to forget that it's a Charles Dickens, um, a, a Christmas, a Christmas Carol. Sorry, oh, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. why that. I was just like, which one, which one? Blank. Yes. Uh, but yeah. A Christmas Carol with the Brothers Grimm being obviously the spirits. So that yeah, that's what I have coming out in 2022. Holy moly. You are, I wish I could keep a structure like that because I have like a loose structure of how many things I want to release in a year, but life sometimes gets in the way or maybe my editor got a little bogged down. And so I am so hesitant to let people know all the things that I'm intending to release because what if one gets pushed off, <laughs> you know, but my intention is audiobooks will be out there. Tomorrow will be the box set of the first box set of my garden speaker, um, which is again, July 25th, 25th, July 15th, 2022. And hoping to push out two more novellas and a full length for my young adult before the end of the year. Will that happen? We don't know. We will see. <laughs> That's but, awesome. but thank you again for, you know, coming out and talking with me. And if you ever want to do this again, especially when you start letting out your novella, your new series, just let me know. It's fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to check out your Viking series. <laughs> well, hopefully you <laughs> like some dark, darker literature, but I, I think they're a lot of fun. And I'm super excited about you know, your twists on fairy tales. I'm definitely going to put some of those on my wish list now, like right after this, because that's so exciting. <laughs> Yay. But, yeah. um, and to everybody who was watching, thank you. And yeah, I'll be posting all her content on my YouTube video, which I'll put out next week below. So you check her out and yay. Thank you. Bye. Take care.